being recorded. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, I believe that uh, at this time we are we are broadcasting, and I'm hoping that I'm hopeful that that all of you can hear me okay, and uh, we're we're we're, uh, we're projecting. Um, I am delighted uh, to be uh, leading this, uh, kicking off this conversation tonight. If you can look across the, on our, our presentation uh, software here tonight, you, there's quite a few names at the top of this list. You see NEA, Ed Communities, University of Toledo, and Corwin Press. Each of those entities that, that you see here are actually sponsoring this event tonight to bring you this really unique and we know very helpful professional development experience. First, the NEA, the National Education Association, uh, they are the founder of Ed Communities. And if you haven't been on Ed Communities yet, Ed Communities is a really inspirational and, and quite useful resource for all teachers. It's a free resource where teachers come together and have a chance to build community, create connections, to solve problems, and to fi frankly find each other. They find each other and work on problems um, all over the country. We have some of the most important topics being addressed in ed communities. Um, everything from dealing with students from the school to prison pipeline to all kinds of very specific and discrete issues in literacy. Next, uh, bringing you this wonderful uh, seminar tonight is the, the University of Toledo. Uh, my name is Dr. Casey Rees and I'm a professor with the University of Toledo and I've worked with my friends with the NEA and my friends with Corwin and I'm delighted to be hosting this uh, event with our, our again, wonderful uh, guest speaker. And finally, our, our the publisher who is uh, helping work with us on these events uh, is Corwin Press. Corwin Press, uh, we've been working with Corwin Press now for about a year, and we have been working on trying to identify some of the, the most exciting up-and-coming authors who are, are making a difference in the field of education, and we'll be working every, each month uh, throughout the year uh, we will be presenting various Colin Press authors as they bring us uh, some exciting, very exciting work from their field. And I'm delighted, uh, um, Barbara, I'm going to be telling, uh, talking, uh, turning this over to Barbara in just a second as she tells us a bit about her brand new book called How to Personalize Learning. And Barbara, this is a special night, isn't it? Because uh, this not only is uh, going to be a, uh, a, a webinar opportunity for us, the opportunity for us to connect, but it's also the a kickoff for this book. This book is uh, this is the a sort of official release party, isn't it, Barbara? For your 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 site being uh, uh, your book being out and available, it's it's uh, to, it's uh, available in print. Did it come? When did it actually officially come available uh, for print? Today. Today, Today was the day. Yes. Now, when when did you get it in your hands? We don't have it in our hands yet. Um, okay. It, we'll probably get copies on Monday. Okay. But it's very exciting. It's out today. <laughs> so that's why well, when you invited us, this is invited me to do this. It was pretty exciting when you said the day. Sure. And for those of you listening, that 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 what Barbara's describing is common uh, for for authors today. We. We'll put books out there, and in many cases, uh, you'll get it in your hands before the author does because the publisher is so anxious for you to have it. So we're really happy for you to, to be joining us tonight, all of our, our guests tonight. And uh, I know we have it right now. If you look at your screen, you've got a conversation uh, blog going, and, and uh, folks, are there's, there's room for you. There's going to be room for you to ask some questions here at the end, and we look forward to that. So what we'll do tonight is I, I'm going to – Turn this over. Barbara's going to spend a few minutes chatting with us, and when that's over, uh, that part of it's over, we'll we'll uh, entertain. I'll entertain a few questions with her, and then we're going to turn it over to all of you, all of you who are kind enough to to join us tonight. Uh, we're going to look for your questions, so uh, they will be an opportunity for you to uh, to ask us questions uh, in just a few minutes. But um, I'm going to take a few minutes right now for you to introduce Barbara and her book. So I'm again. We're really excited. This is uh, hot, literally hot off the presses. Brand, her brand new book with her co-author, uh, How to Personalize Learning. Um, and and Barbara, I know, is going to tell us about the content and a little bit about the book tonight. But just get, let me give you a few words about Barbara to start with. Barbara is a creative learning officer and co-founder for Personalized Learning. She's the co-author of Making Learning Personal and How to Personalize Learning with Kathleen McClaskey. 
She is also the co-founder of My Coach, and she blogs her views at Rethinking Learning. Barbara is created is a creative learning strategist. She's a writer, a keynoter. She's a change agent, uh, and a, a very enthusiastic one, I will add. And she's an instructional designer and a facilitator. She assists, assists large and small organizations in transforming teaching and learning through action research, project-based learning, design thinking, and, and the redesign of teacher practice around learner-centered environments. She also builds coaching programs and communities of practice where teachers are facilitators, advisors, or mentors, and guides the development of cultures of learning where teachers and learners become partners in learning. So Barbara has made it her life's work to research and find strategies for personalized learning so learners at any age and strength can develop agency so that they can follow their passion and discover their purpose. So, Barbara, with that with that introduction, I, I, that, that all of that is great, but not as good as as uh, hearing you. So, I can't wait for the audience to have a chance to to hear the words. I know you're going to share this evening about your book and about your career. And I know everyone, please, as you're dialing in tonight, uh, listen for those opportunities to collect some great ideas for applications in your learning community. So, without further ado, Barbara, are you ready to jump in and uh, and take over here? I sure am. Thank Great. you so thank much. You. That was really nice. And I want to thank you, um, University of Toledo, uh, NEA and Ed Community, and definitely Corwin Press for all, you know, first getting the opportunity for, us to sh for me to share the book. I also see that Kathleen McClaskey is in the audience, and I need to give her a big shout out. I couldn't do this book without her. Um, we have been on a journey together, and we started Six years ago, um, I, I'm in California. Kathleen's in New Hampshire, and she was at a conference in California, and that's when we met. And we started talking about, you know, personalizing learning and doing all of this some time ago. And I'm going to talk about some of the um, products and things that we did and created. But um, it led to our first book, which was Make Learning Personal, which actually came out October 2014, and that was based on our course, the five W's of personalized learning, which is the what, the who, the wow, the where, and the why. And it ended up turning out pretty cool. <laughs> it became a bestseller, and Corwin talked to us about coming back and doing the how, and that's kind of how this happened. So. Kathleen and I have been working on that for some time and pretty excited. So I see you, Kathleen, in the audience. I'm sending you a big shout-out to you. Um, so I'm going to tell about the book. I want to kind of go through, share that there's nine chapters, that we have activities, templates, resources, links, and more, and including a companion website. And I want to, you know, just have a few examples from different chapters in the book. I also want to share um, Pam Lowe is in the audience. She helps us kind of get everything out on social media, and she runs P Learn Chat. So you see at the bottom of the slide, there's some Twitter handles there. Um, P Learn Chat is ours. Um, so if you're going to be on Twitter, please use that chat, that Twitter handle. Plus, Ed Chat and Learn Chat is from NEA and Colin Press. Definitely Corwin. So if you can, if you're out there, uh, we'll be able to help you. So thank you so much um, for being here, and I'm going to go on and start talking about our book. It starts with um, the PDI chart. That's the personalization versus differentiation versus individualization chart that we created when we first got together. It seems like we made a difference. <laughs> so, Kathleen, if you're there, you can kind of write in the chat some of your ideas about this, because when we first put this out on the Internet, it went wild. We got so many downloads and people wanting it. So we're now on uh, the version 3 on it, and it's in millions of downloads in every language, and it's, on, it's just all over. Let me just explain a little bit about it. Um, with differentiation and individualization, the teacher is directing the learning. With personalization, the learner is directing the learning. You know, teachers tell us that they're working harder than ever. That's kind of why we put that picture in there. But 
in a personalized learning environment, the learner is taking more responsibility for the learning and is motivated to want to learn. In traditional classrooms, the missing piece in the conversations to transform education is the learner. You know, this is what we believe. We believe if we focus on the learner and how they learn best, we can create personalized learning environments that start with the learner. So, to move a school district and their school community to personalized learning, there has to be a common language. And this common language cultivates a shared understanding, belief system, and commitment among all stakeholders about what personalized learning means for the learners. And you see this list? It's kind of a compilation of what educators have shared with us about what personalized learning means. It's about changing teaching and learning and moving to a competency-based system and much more that we have on here. In fact, that the Wordle was created from this list. And what a lot of teachers are doing uh, and administrators, are, they're taking whatever their common language is and generating uh, that a Wordle or they're putting the words all around their school. So this, we get strategies in Chapter 1. And I hope, um, Casey, I'm going to be going through. If I'm going over too much, just let me know because I get really excited <laughs> about all this, you know. <laughs> it's infectious. You're fine. You're doing great. Thanks. Oh, good. Thank you. Okay. So, Chapter 2. This is where we discuss universal design for learning. And that was developed by CAS, which is the Center for Applied Special Technology. This is based on neuroscience. The three UDL, and it's called UDL, so you'll probably hear that. The UDL principles are multiple means of representation, multiple means of expression, and multiple means of engagement. The UDL principles provide the framework for personalizing learning and can assist teachers in planning universally designed lessons that can reduce barriers to learning, as well as optimizing levels of challenge and support to meet the needs of all learners from the start. See, the goal in education is to help turn learners into expert learners, individuals who want to learn, who know how to learn, and who in their own individual and flexible ways are well prepared for a lifetime of learning. So I'm going to kind of go a little deeper. See, we change the terms from the principles to reflect how a learner may access, engage, and express so we made that, So, and I'm going to go through what that means. Multiple means of representation represents the what. That's about a learner accessing and processing information. Multiple means of engagement represents the why. That's when the learner engages with the content. And multiple means of expression and action represents the how, about the learner expressing what they know and understand. But you see, now that ESSA, you know, that every student succeeds, succeeds at, endorses UDL, it was clear to us to emphasize UDL as a scientifically based approach for teaching and learning and to assist teachers in making learning personal for all learners. So I hope I, I'm kind of going kind of deep here, but I see a few people I know in the audience, so... Um, hopefully they've heard some of this. If not, if this is new, put it in the uh, chat and we'll talk about it. So, Universal Design for Learning, or UDL, is not about learners overcoming their barriers. It is about reducing or eliminating the barriers that keep learners from learning. The, you know, CAS created digital books for those who, with reading challenges. Those with limited vocabulary needed linked definitions. Those with low vision needed large buttons that talked and, and so on. So what Cass realized was that curriculum, not the learner, was the problem. So UDL is an approach to curriculum that minimizes barriers and maximizes learning for all learners. UDL is a lens to personalized learning. So in Chapter 4, we walk you through this process how to create a learner profile, 
personal learning backpack and personal learning plan. And just to let you know, we also created a companion website with the templates and additional resources. But plus, we have our own website, which is personalizedlearning.com, that's personalized without the D, where we share this process in a three-part blog series with an example of one learner. You see, we really believe if each learner shares their voice and you build a relationship between teacher and learner, the learner becomes more self-confident and advocates for themselves as a learner. So I'm going to take you into a learner profile so you can see what it looks like. Here you can see it gives voice to the learner and what they see as their strengths and challenges. And this is an example from a middle school girl who enjoys art, but she has some challenges. So the learner profile helps the learner tell their story about how they learn, and it validates them as a learner. In addition, it opens the door for the teacher to have a conversation with the learner about learning goals and strategies they need to work on. The learner profile can be used regularly throughout the year to help the learner measure their own progress around their learning goals and strategies they have used. So I'm only giving you a little bit here, but I just want to make sure you see it. So I'm going to take you in to the class on snapshot, which is in Chapter 5. This is about anticipating four learners at the extremes that you have or may have in your class or classes. What we've been doing for way too long is teaching to the average, and there is no average. The snapshot helps you universally design your lesson that includes tools and instructional methods to teach the maximum amount of learners by anticipating just four learners. And some coaches and professional developers do this with, you know, help teachers also. This is called the anticipatory set that includes the strengths and challenges that your learners have in accessing, engaging, and expressing what they know along with interests they have. So after you do that, then you're putting together the, what we call the preferences and needs to access, engage, and express for each one of these learners. This is in combination with knowing their strengths, interests, and challenge, challenges. This informs you as a teacher not only about instructional strategy, but also what to include in the class learning toolkit. And I'm going to show you just kind of an overview of it. I'm not going to do a lot of detail here, but here you can choose apps and tools that will support how they learn. And this is kind of like the top class learning toolkit. Also includes instructional methods that can meet the needs of most of your learners in the class. And, and most importantly, learners need to develop the skills and learning strategies on how to use these tools so they can be, you know, use them independently, and that way they can support their own learning. So in the book, what we do is we walk you through this process and guide you how to use the templates along with ideas for instructional methods and learning strategies. I'm going to take a breath <laughs> and go on. Here we go. Because um, there's some exciting things we want to make sure you have. And Chapter 6, what we take you through is we walk you through an example lesson using the four-step process for lesson design. Step 1 is about listing the instructional methods, materials, and assessments that you currently use for your lessons. Step two, how do you describe what your learners currently are required to do with these methods, materials, and assessments? And step three is where you bring out that class learning snapshot to identify possible barriers your learners may have. And then step four, you review your classroom toolkit that you put together and include, indicate UDL solutions that can reduce the barriers that any of the learners might have. And so what we did is we have templates, uh, the process there, an example, and we put that in the book and also available on the companion website for you. Chapter 8 reviews the stages of personalized learning environments. And, you know, we, we developed this as a process for teachers to create learner-centered and eventually learner-driven environments. 
And one reason why we brought this together and made this was after we put the PDI chart, some teachers got a little overwhelmed thinking they had to be learner-driven or learner-centered. And so Kathleen and I put together the stages so that you could start with stage one, still teacher-centered by taping your toes into personalized learning. And we have updated this so many times. We're now on version five, and that is on the inside cover of, I mean, the back side, the back cover of our new book, the inside of the back cover. Okay, I hope I'm not confusing people, <laughs> um, but I get excited about it because the book's out. <laughs> So here's another one I want to share is the chapter three, and this is about um, how to develop agency so that learners become independent, self-directed, and self-motivated. And we developed this after we did a collaborative blog series with the Institute for Personalized Learning with Jim Nicobaugh and Jean Garrity. We did six, six blogs and, uh, with them. And in it, we saw the power of learner agency, and we identified these seven elements and then realized that we needed to show with um, charts and uh, graphics how to move uh, along this continuum. So I wanted to show you one of them. Uh, actually, I'll show you two. This was, I think, one of the first ones we did was the continuum of voice. And we were referring to a report called uh, Motivation, Engagement, and Student Voice by Eric Tashala and um, Michael Nicola from the students at the center. Because what we realized, you know, we tell teachers to encourage voice, but what does it mean? And after reading the report, we decided to adapt the chart they had in the report with our process on how to move to learner agency. So we're really lucky. Uh, we've been working with Sylvia Duckworth, who designed these graphics for us, and these are in our book. <laughs> and they're also on our website, and Sylvia also has her own website, which is sylviaduckworth.com. And, you know, as you can see, if you look, all the way from the left to the right, um, right from the beginning, you want to encourage learners even with the learner profile and teacher-centered uh, under expression, you want to help them advocate for themselves. I want to show you another one. Um, the continuous choice. This is where teachers can dip their toes into personalized learning by providing a menu of options. But you see, the learner is still a participant, and the teacher is still the one providing the choices. When you can see in this graphic, when a learner takes on more responsibility, they can direct their own learning. Developing agency means creating self-directed independent learners who can advocate for themselves and eventually self-regulate learning based on what they're passionate about so they have a meaningful life with purpose. So I'm going to show you what we have on the inside of the front cover. Here's a, just an excerpt of it. Uh, what we did is we pulled together as a crosswalk, um, and like I said, it's on the inside of the front of the cover. We wanted to show how you can move across the stages with each of these elements. And there's teachers right now we've been working with and, and administrators who told us this is a great guide that they can use right now to tell where they are in personalizing learning. And one administrator mentioned to us, that she has teachers circle where they think they are in the process so they can have conversations around their own personal professional learning. So I, I that made both Kathleen and I pretty happy when we said that this can be helpful. So that is on the inside of the front cover. And I'm almost done. I just want to kind of cover a little bit because we were going through the getting started and now we're going a little deeper. Chapter 7. That's about delving into deeper learning, where we expand on the lesson we started in Chapter 6, and we use project-based learning. And we started the chapter off with the difference of project versus PBL. And this fits in with our book and the strategies we 
is with the UDL and moving to learner agency. You know, because it really, if you look at what it, the difference is, it's about letting go and encouraging learners to use inquiry to challenge themselves around a real-world problem and consider the process more than the product. Um, so um, all, we have the lesson in there. We have turned it into a project. We give you ideas on how to use standards and all of that. I also want to show you some other things we've done is we invited educators who have dedicated their work to transforming teaching and learning. And one is Jackie, Dr. Jackie Gerstein, who wrote a blog for us on meaningful and relevant focus that we included in our book. And the main context of her post was that just learning facts without a context means learners cannot connect the fact to real learning. So we're really grateful to Jackie. She continues to find research and supports our work. And we constantly point to her, and we even share her post. But she's not the only one. We included stories from many educators throughout her book, which helped connect her book to real-world experiences and relevant research. And I have a downloadable file that I put uh, links to her, her post and others, so you'll be able to download that. In fact, I have another, and I'm almost at the end here, so I just want to let you know. <laughs> um, but there's so much in our book. I just wanted to share some, kind of take out some. And so this is from Paula Ford. She's a kindergarten teacher in California. She she wanted to demonstrate that you could do PBL um, that is learner-centered with kindergartners. And she had her children design a PBL. Actually, they came up with it because they have a connection with a school in Kenya. And they wanted to figure out a way to support the school and do some things. So they actually created crafts and came up with some different projects that they could do to collect money to send to the school. And um, it's been really exciting for them. So what we have throughout our book is QR codes that go to the posts or any other resources that we try to, um, that we shared in the book. So that's another thing that we have. And our last chapter provides strategies, activities, and stories on how to move from traditional classrooms to a culture of learning. And I wanted to include the quote from Chris Watkins from the UK. He has been one of our mentors and helped us understand how people learn. So we refer to much of his work in the book and his website with multiple resources and research. And his uh, and I have a link to that on the handout, but it's chriswalkins.net. So you can see this idea of moving from traditional to learning centered is similar to some of the things we talked about before. So what we did is we pulled together, Kathleen and I looked at this for the book and said, we need to make it visual. So we pulled together the idea of when teaching is telling and the focus is mostly on test prep, you can see what words stand out with the wordle on the left. You see, Kathleen and I wrote this book because we had to. It's time to change teaching and learning now. Our learners need their voice in how and what they learn. And so we use a scientifically based approach with UDL to understand how learners learn and what strategies we can do to support them. This is why we wrote this book. And, and we hope you find it helpful with your journey to personalized learning. So I want to show you who we are. That's us. <laughs> um, that's me on the left, and that's Kathleen on the right. And there's a picture of our website. I tried to put that in. Uh, we updated our website, and there's information on how you can get a hold of us. And if you're on Twitter, I didn't put our uh, Twitter here, but I put it on um, handles on the handout. I'm at bbray27, Kathleen is at khmmc, and we have P Learn Chat, and Pam Lowe is there with us with that. <laughs> and we also, just to let you know, we do a Twitter chat every other Monday night, and our next one is next Monday, and we're doing, actually, it's not going to be the one on launching. That's when we decided to change that. We're going to do that on November 7th. 
this next one is because of Halloween's coming, we went, don't be scared, dip your toes into personalized learning. So um, anyway, <laughs> did I do okay on this? <laughs> Casey, I tried to get in as much as I could um, and let them know that there's also a discount code for the people that are here uh, on the webinar, I mean on the handout that they can download. And it gives them, um, Corin is offering them a uh, priority code for this. Are you there? <laughs> okay, so Kathleen, I got to make sure. Um, Sorry, Barbara. I, I actually was on. I was on mute there, making sure I wasn't too loud for you. I apologize. You, you, oh, you, no, you no. did a great job. I, I appreciate it. And thanks for sharing those codes. I wanted to let everybody who was listening in know as well that uh, we were going to also in that learning space that there ever that uh, um, Randy was nice enough to share in Ed Communities. There will be uh, in in a short period of time. We're going to have a link. To, uh, to, to this video that you'll be able to see it again because Barbara did a great job of going through many of the elements of this book and I think that you might even want to re consult back to this and so that you can even get more information because she covered so much and how you might actually apply it. So, um, so Barbara, thank you for, for all of that. Um, can I ask, can, we, can I start with just a couple of really basic questions that you probably at this point, uh, you've probably heard a, a, a thousand times, but I, for those who are just dialing in, can I start there? Sure. Okay. So what when, when as you try to get into the topic of personalizing learning, especially for teachers today in schools with geez larger than ever classes, what well, how do you what do you do when teachers say, geez, I really want to personalize the environment, but it's getting so it's tough for me because I've just got so many students. What what uh, what do you what what's your response to that? Well, um, one of the responses is first we have to find out where they are now. So. Um, you know, because when you personalize learning, it doesn't matter how many students you have in the class because they're going to be taking over their learning. And what what happens sometimes for some teachers that have tend to have more, especially in some of the schools out here in California, um, there might not be a lot of room in the classroom. So one of their worries is, how do I do this? I'm usually in the front of the classroom. So what some have done is re, um, rethink the design of their classroom. So they're not the ones standing up in front of the class anymore, and they're looking at grouping um, kids maybe in small groups. They might have a place where they can work individually. They might have a place where there could be whole group instruction. And you can even do that in smaller areas. But um, when I mentioned that when kids get to know who, how they learn best and you're giving them more voice and choice when the class is set up so you're not the one constantly providing all the information and you're giving them strategies, it kind of just happens. It doesn't matter how many are in the class. I don't know if that makes sense or not. I, I do, it does. I, I think when, when it comes to this topic, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I hear people getting the concept of personalized learning confused with individualized instruction. I mean, what you're talking about is a systemic approach to really changing how, how you know, students see the learning, how, how the, the people facilitating the learning see their jobs. I mean, it's, it's a systemic uh, approach, and it's different than individualized learning. But unfortunately, like I said, people along the way, I think sometimes they have a tough time, I don't know, maybe differentiating those concepts. Have you seen that too? Yeah. Well, that's one reason why Kathleen and I put together the the PDI chart on the difference between mm -hmm. personalization and individualization, you know, differentiation and sure. individualization. Because one of the problems is, well, I'm just going to bring up, we're, we only know what we know and what we were mm -hmm. taught as teachers in the teacher education program or as learners ourselves. And... Um, sometimes the system itself is keeping us from taking risks and allowing us to um, let go ourselves because we have so many man you know, so many things that we're mandated to do as teachers. So what we want to do, like Kathleen just wrote in the chat, personalized learning is about changing the culture in the school mm -hmm. or in the classroom, and since 
um, it's very difficult for a teacher sometimes to do this on their own if the whole school is still using this traditional model. But if you're sure. looking at, because um, you said systemic, <laughs> it is a system, uh, like Michael Fullen says, and, and some others say systemness that we've been building in conformity and compliancy. We, we need to look at how we're going to move to that. So if we want learners of all ages to take more responsibility, we have to look at how we're going to change teacher and learner roles, how we're going to change even in some places those schedules, they tend to get in the way. <laughs> and um, does that make sense? It does, and, and and for those of you who are listening in and thinking about your own classrooms, I mean, everything that, that Barbara and Kathleen are talking about is completely the opposite of how schools were originally designed. We were originally designed for whole group instruction because the goal was to get you to move on mass for a, a different kind of economy for sure. So if, if as an instructor this seems like, you know, wow, it is a little bit, it, it's a different way of thinking, well, it's because truly by design schools were wrongly designed to do something very different. So the idea that on a topic like this that you'd be very purposeful about making a personalized, your classroom uh, under the auspices of personalized learning just makes so much sense. Barbara, tell me how, you know, in, in this book, and I know that you have a passion for helping teachers to change their, their, you know, to give them the supports they need. Is this book kind of designed to be used as just a, kind of a guide on the side that, that I mean, like how do you, how do you recommend that they, they actually use this resource? Is it something they can they can just pop open and start planning along with unit planning? How do you how do you recommend they actually use it? Well, this book is kind of like a complement to our other book, Make Learning Personal, which was more of the how and it wasn't the how, it was the what and the um, you know, like I said the what, the who and the the wow, the where and the why and need the why first um, before you do the how. And uh, so a lot of people want to just jump right into the how. They could do it. They could look at it. But if they don't understand it and they're not, they don't get the support they need, um, they might find that this needs to be a whole sy system that's working together if they're going to take this on. Um, so what we've had is uh, we've been doing this for now almost five years, I think, um, where we've done our course first. Um, and now some people are taking our first book and doing book studies first. So they really get the language. Remember I mentioned in the beginning, Chapter 1 was all about the common language. Um, it's like all of us are kind of like excited and want to jump in and do this together. It makes it different than when you have a teacher just to read the book on their own, which they can still do. They can still try this on their own, but they, it'll be a lot better if they're part of a community that's working together to make this happen. Because things have to change. You might find that um, if you're going to do projects, then subjects, if, you know, instead of teaching subjects, you might be teaching themes. Does that make sense? You might change some things. Sure. And that means sure. And, 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 more time. Sure. Yeah, and that, and the ability to construct community, I mean, that is so important. And as a big, you know, to, to revert back to our pitch at the beginning with Ed Communities, that's what Ed Communities is all about. You know, we've got, we've got teachers in the line, and I, I know some of the teachers in the line here from different parts of the country, and they, they are absolutely, you know, they can absolutely find each other and, and to help implement a good, some good ideas. Uh, certainly like these. So, um, Barbara, with with you know with this concept, can you tell us some success stories to kind of give us some perspective about maybe some clients you've worked with or some teachers you've worked with? How have you seen? What are some changes that you've seen as a result of having had a chance to implement this model? Well, I'll give you a few. I'll, I'll start with Verona Area Schools up in um, Wisconsin. They um, they wanted to go right from the beginning and start building that community. So they had different cohorts of teachers uh, work, you know, together in teams, taking our course but also implementing. And they uh, made a, a concerted effort to build a coaching model. So they have 
coaches, two coaches that are um, available to support the teachers on site. And so what they've also realized is they needed to change some, some of the ways they teach by providing co-teaching models and even opening some of the um, walls so they could have two rooms available. So you might have a teacher who is um, really great at direct instruction and another who is more comfortable in small group work or working one-on-one -on -one or working on projects. And then they work together and support each other. Can you just imagine if you're a teacher right now, you're working in isolation, or you're closing the door, you're working and trying to cover everything instead of uncovering the learning, you know, I mean, you're <laughs> you don't go deep. But if you have another adult in the classroom, just imagine what you could do. And so that's what Verona is doing. What do you think of that one? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's great, and I'm glad that uh, you've had some folks taking advantage of it, and I, I truly do, again, those communities of practice, finding colleagues. Uh, we've had some great success stories on here, Barbara, of actually educators finding each other, making really essential contacts, and, 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 and then really expanding on some of their thinking. Um, so, you know, I guess what's, what's, what do you think the future of this, this concept will be? What do you think the next – Sort of the next things that you're thinking about. I know you're probably already thinking about your next book, but what will be the next sort of the, the direction of this topic? And before you answer that, I'll invite the audience that uh, while 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 Barbara is thinking about the future of this topic, I'd invite anybody who's available or interested uh, to to post a question now. Now is a great time to ask your questions. We'd love to entertain your questions at the end. We've gotten the conversation started. So, Barbara, what's the future of this topic? Well, the future is that it's already here. We are starting to see now, because of the new SS, the SSA regulation, is that they've already brought in UDL and endorsing it as a way to um, get to know your learners. And not, people are starting to realize that learning styles are really not the way to um, measure who a, describe a learner. They need to figure out really how using the neuroscience is how you can understand how a learner learns best. But also, the other thing that's happening is competency-based education. This is the way we're starting to move. We're looking at um, the way that schools are set up with, with, um, by grades and age level uh, isn't looking for every child. <laughs> and it hasn't for a long time. And it was built on a system to kind of manage manage learning, where now you have someone in fifth grade that might have, be at an eighth grade level in reading and a third grade level in math or something. So what is happening is um, the whole, our country and in the United States, we're moving to competency base. So they're looking like at the Adams 50, um, which is a school district in Colorado, has already changed the um, to level, and they've got competency-based report cards, and they're also looking at what kinds of skills are the kids going to need instead of teaching individual subjects. They're looking at the skills that they really need to learn. And um, what a, but what about technology? How how what kind of role will technology play? Because you know, so much of our culture today is driven by devices that allow us to personalize you know, our learning in, in less, you know, less certainly less formal ways. How does technology play into this? Well, both Kathleen and I were ed technologists. This was our background. And so I love technology. Um, it just has to be used appropriately. And here's the other thing is that kids use smartphones. Kids, this, they're born, they're all wired different than we are. So... We need to use these uh, tools, but um, it's got to be done appropriately. You're not just sitting in front of a computer with a headset and having them go through a program but not building the relationship and be able to, you know, get their voice. They need to be able to use the tools in a different way. And so uh, some of the things that we're seeing is that some schools are doing bring your own device. They're also looking at strategies to build that toolkit and personal learning backpack 
and having kids take more control. Here's the, the one thing is we tend to teach, if bear with me, I'm going to use this. <laughs> we tend to teach the Googleable, Googleable, and we don't need to anymore. That's what they're tested on. We need to change this so they're able to use the tool and know how to use them correctly because this is what they're going to use in the real world and use these tools to know that and figure out the ungoogleable. Does that make sense? <laughs> I want to make sure I'm making it clear here. Sure, getting getting beyond what, what might be locally accessible and getting them to, to, to dig a bit deeper and to find uh, richer links to content if, if they're at that level of the ability to personalize. Is that kind of what you're talking about? Definitely. Yeah. They, they, um, the, one of the issues is they need to be independent and self be able to self-direct their learning. That's the whole idea when we were talking about UDL and when we were talking about personal learning backpack and all of that. But we tend to, because of the curriculum, the way the curriculum is designed, this, a lot of times there's only one right answer. They're not really doing that critical thinking and problem solving they're going to need for their own lives, and we need them to be able to do that. Sure, sure. And, and everybody, again, listening, with like some of you were starting to pose some questions. Please feel free. Uh, we're, we'll chat here until we see your question, and we'll happily respond to yours in the chat. So please post a question if you had it. Barbara, tell me about this concept at different levels, uh, different student levels. I know it's referenced in your book, but in terms of, of as, as children develop, uh, how is the application of this concept, I guess at a granular level, how is it different as, as you consider different grade levels and different, uh, at different developmental levels? Well, there, now there is a program called Reggio Emilia that started in preschool where the kids were so independent and self-regulated that I was kind of blown away. These kids are really on their own, but they don't have that background um, and background and experience that, that they, you get when you get older. So mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether that's Sometimes I'm throwing out words, get older is not the way I wanted to say it. But anyway, when they progress, and um, when you're in high school, there's many of these kids at, at um, when they get to high school, they say, all I want to do is just get an A. They've already been, they've lived through a compliant system that their mindset is, you just tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. So I want to bring in Reggio, which and or even Montessori, that kind of strategy where you can learn, you can be the one to find out, the, you know, different strategies, come up with questions, use inquiry, find your passion, whatever your purpose is in life, that kind of thing, instead of getting to high school and just giving up and letting someone else tell you what to do. So um, I think if we can balance that out, that would be great. Does that, and I can t I can yeah. go into high school a little bit more, but I saw a question from Bill here. I don't know if you want me to answer that one. Go go, go right ahead. Go right ahead. Okay. Parents, it's the react. Bill's question was, what has uh, been the reaction of parents to personal life learning? Parents aren't sure about it unless they're brought in as one of the stakeholders when you're designing the vision for personal life learning, like Verona and other. Um, districts that have been doing this, they involve all the stakeholders, including the parents, so they understand that what they're doing is the best for their child. I don't know if that makes sense, um, but if you come in and start as a district and say, well, we're going to personalize learning and this is how we're going to do it and you change something, some parents, especially high school parents, are going to react because they want their kids to get grades, to be able to continue the system the way it was because that's all they know. So they ha you have to bring parents in when you're building that common language or, or it won't work. I hope I don't know if that helps. But most parents, when they know Bill, they're really excited about it, especially because it's, they see a difference in their children. They're more engaged and excited about school. Well, I would think too, and 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 if you're in a community that's that's you know that that certainly watches closely what you do, it's important to communicate this. But I would I would think that this would, Barbara, this would be something that districts can and should uh, frankly celebrate and and position uh, as a 
you know, the degree to which they're committed to it, but this is this is a transformation in service and one where I think most parents certainly want, if just from an affective standpoint, want their kids to be more accountable and own their journey uh, probably more. I mean, I would I would think you've gotten some positive feedback from 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 parents and parent groups mm-hmm. from this approach, even though that's not necessarily who it's for. Well, just tell me a parent that doesn't want their kid to be independent. I mean, let's just say the whole right. idea is you want them to be able to make it in the world, and we've created a compliant kind of learned helplessness with the kids when they get to high school. And so they, I think they like it. We're just in a transitional period because we still have a traditional system in many places, and so we're trying to uh, introduce this. So we just have to try to bring it on and, and have them part of the process. So I think I think we're going to see some really exciting things, but we need parents more involved. Sure, sure. So Are I, there, do you, do you have do you have some some kid examples uh, where you really because our, our our audience tends yeah. to respond really well to those, but do you have some kid examples of of kids that you work with that you really made that observation where it was particularly compelling? Well. We work with um, different kids, you know, because of the teachers and the groups we worked with. There's um, Robin, who was, when we met him, he was 11th grader at Mount Abraham Union Middle High School in Vermont. Mm -hmm. And his whole thing was going through Pathways program, so he got to pick what worked out best for him. So he was able to identify mentors that could support Mm him, and he Mm -hmm. really liked blacksmithing, so one of his mentors was even a younger student um, to help him win, with something, and then another adult out in the working world to help him. So they that's the thing I didn't really talk about. Um, there are high schools now and middle schools that are looking at other ways to build um, skills. So they're looking at job shadowing, internships, apprenticeships some ways that online courses, other ways to meet the needs that you might not be able to get in school. And that's what Robin was able to find. And sure. um, it was really, ex- it, you know, exceptional to watch that. That's only one example. We have more, but time. <laughs> Barbara, do you, do you see Ida's question there? Yeah. Um, we walk through Ida. Uh, we walk through um showing how to do the learner profile with a young child. Um, what many, what different groups have told us um, is that they might do it a little different because we say the words access, engage, and express. Um, there were several uh, primary teachers that said, what if we use the word get, do, show? So they changed the wording. They maybe change it so they're using um, audio files so they can hear it. They're also using visual drawings with it. In fact, one school uses a little flower garden and has the petals are all the competencies and the skills that they're learning so they can use it that way. I think that's the whole idea of personalized learning. It looks different everywhere. And she also said, Leonard Helplessness starts way before high school, and you are right. It starts really <laughs> as soon as you start school. They tell you you got to stand in line. You got to put your head down. You got because all these things they tell us to do, but we're not. We need to change it so we're really getting kids excited about wanting to learn. Absolutely, that yeah. That, that it makes sense. Good. That curious and Ida, please feel free to. If there's more that you need to know, please jump in. But um, I think your I think it probably starts. Even earlier, if you look at some of the, the, the research on the earliest of early childhood and, and some of the way we, we interact with kids at their youngest age really helps to create either a curious child or, or one that, you're right, already is looking for others to, to soothe and solve for them. So creating independent learners, and, boy, you're right about I really like the fact that, and I'd love it, maybe you speak to this, too, as we kind of wrap up, but. I like the fact that even in your bio and in your discussion here, you really seem focused on getting through this approach, getting kids ready for sort of the world beyond. Um, and, of course, it's focused on the classroom. But did you, did, did, did you and, and Kathleen, and by the way, Kathleen, I, I want to give you credit too, but did the two of you 
Were you thinking about those adult learners who will benefit from this eventually when you put all this together? Was that a focus? Yes, yes. It was. What happened is as soon as we started doing this for teachers, we started realizing, wait a minute, parents, um, anyone who's involved in, you know, helping a child, we started realizing all of us are learners too. We were brought up in a system to be compliant really hard and to get out of that comfort zone ourselves. So we see that I had to stretch myself. I I didn't, you know, just knowing that I, um, you know, having this idea of agency means that all of us have to be future ready. Oh, how funny. Kathleen just wrote the same thing. Or <laughs> Kathleen and I think a lot alike. I mean, it's like weird now. So, um but that's why we wrote two books, and we're really excited about this one because we feel so many people ask for the how, and we wanted to give it. But we, we just really want to make sure that before they jump in, they really think about how they're going to build the community of, and, you know, community of learners and that culture of learning so everyone's involved, so parents don't come back and fight it. Or teach sure. the kids. Kids will fight it, too. Sure. Well, I, I just like the idea of, of you know, with, with a, a generation of kids who, who frankly, they, they do develop that greater degree of self-advocacy and, and efficacy, and they, they, they own their journey, and they, you know, they, they, they think critically about the kind of learning experiences they can and should be, you know, providing for themselves. Just think about if the longitudinal effect for kids if they're if they're just more in charge of their learning and frankly every year of their lives afterwards all the things that uh, they can certainly do um you know all of us i think could try to be learners lifelong learners you, you you see the world differently when you're you're gobbling up as much learning as possible don't you and if we can breed that in breeds the wrong word but if you could instill that rather with kids at a much earlier age i, I just think the uh the benefits you know for our culture and or innovation and so many things, I would imagine, Barbara, that it's uh, it will it will pay many many dividends. Well, but we just need a whole. <laughs> we need our um, everyone to be able to be critical thinkers so they can make good choices uh, and something that's for the best interest. And right now, I a lot of us don't know how to do that. We we ask. I mean, I've talked, I, just real quick, I know we have to go pretty soon, but um, I had a, a group I was working with in um, Southern California, and the high schooler said to me, I have a lot of questions. What am I going to do? I have to get A's to get into the college. I have to get this, and, and, and I need to do that. And they, they're they so tied to the system right now that it's kind of like we've got to balance it. What can we do now and slowly change the system? and then get everyone involved. And Bill said, he's right, you know, I'm thinking engaging parents in the same process is important. We need everyone on board so all of us can work together is what we need. Yep. Looks like there's some more well, questions. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, I, I think that, I, I hope this has been wonderfully helpful to people. I think we've, uh, if there's any other questions uh, or any other final comments, now's a good time because we're getting close to the top of the hour. But, um, I, Barbara, I'm just delighted that you took you uh, used this venue for this launch, a book launch uh, for something that you've worked this hard at. And for those of you dialing in, I mean, you've, you've probably been working at this over a year. And so we're just delighted and honored that uh, all of the friends gathered today here uh, from all over the country. Have, uh, you've shared this, this, this really great moment with us to share this uh, maiden voyage for your work and, and, and probably wasn't exciting and and even emotional time, I would imagine, getting this all kicked off. So thank you so much for sharing uh, really uh, that exciting moment with us. We, we normally have different topics, but we haven't had a, a book launch. So we're really happy that you did that. So thank you so much. Oh. Well, I, I just have to thank Kathleen. Um, like I said, Kathleen and Pam. Kathleen McCarthy has been my partner in this journey, and it's been amazing. And Pamela, who is also on here, has really supported us. So I, I need to give them credit. I did not do any of this alone. This is uh, we're 
this is the whole thing. We all have to kind of be on the journey together because we learn from each other. And thank Absolutely. you, Casey. You're a wonderful interviewer, so thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did some we, we did some pre interview too, didn't we, Barbara? So and and, and, and yeah. Kathleen, I look forward to meeting you sometime. And thanks for joining us. And everybody who joined us this evening, thank you so much. And as, as Karen, first of all, also I'd love to thank Karen Johnson. Okay. Karen, thank you from the NEA. Wonderful job of helping us get it and getting this all organized. And Brandy Bitchler as well, uh, a, a leader with Ed Communities. I should have mentioned your name, Brandy, right away, but I wanted to make sure we gave uh, Barbara all the time. But thank you so much for your leadership and uh, really all the leadership at NEA for helping coordinate Ed Communities in this entire event. So thank you. Thank you so much, NEA. And everyone who joined us this evening on the East Coast, I know it's late in the West Coast, have a great evening. But, Barbara, I know we'll be in touch. And if you want to download tonight's presentation, as Karen has mentioned here, well, this course will be open for a few minutes here. But if you want to download it, um, it will be available in Ed Communities and the link that you pro that was provided. So uh, anything else, anything else, uh, Barbara, that uh, left off? Any last, uh, any last pitches you want to make for us that we can take with us before we go? No, just to check out the, if you can download the handout, the um, discount code is on there from Corwin. And I do want to thank Corwin, uh, especially Ariel Bartlett. She was our editor, and she helped us so much. And, um, I mean, I, I could go on and on. We had so many people help us. So, and we did put that in the book. We thanked, we thanked everyone. So thank you so much, Casey. All right. A great, great time. So. Wonderful event, and to anyone anyone listening later uh, to this to this video later, uh, we we hope you enjoyed as well as everyone who was here live tonight. So everyone, have a great evening, and thanks again. Thanks. Bye. Bye. -bye.